Over the hills and far away, the Teletubbies have come to play. Around the tree, here come some friends. They love to play and they love to dance. One and two and three and four. Now it's time, get ready to explore. Teletubbies, Teletubbies, it's almost time for Teletubbies. Come along, take my hand, it's time for Teletubbies and friends. There's Tinky Winky. That's me! The second is Dipsy. That's right! There's Lala and Paul, Uh-oh. the youngest one, and they always know how to have Yay. some fun. Telly Tubbies, it's almost time for Telly Tubbies. Come along, <laughs> take my hand, it's time for Telly Tubbies and friends. Welcome to Tubby Friend Land. Today, we're going to be learning about a lot of dinosaurs. Yeah, dinosaurs. I love dinosaurs. They're so awesome with their roars and how big they are. I'm pretending to be a dinosaur myself, and I am called the Dipsaurus. <laughs> oh, boy, I love dinosaurs. <clears throat> I'm pretending to be a dinosaur as well. Oh, what's your species, Tinky Winky? I am the Tinko Winkosaur. Roar! <laughs> wow, cool name. My name is the Dipsaurus. Roar! <laughs> wow, I like that. La 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 I'm a dinosaur as well. I am called the Lalasaurus, and this is the sound of a Lalasaurus. La 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 la! What do you think of that? Yeah, yeah, that's a pretty good dinosaur sound, Lala. Yeah, pretty good to annoy someone. What? Nothing, nothing. You do a good dinosaur sound. Ah, thank you. What do you think of that? Yeah, yeah, that's a pretty good dinosaur sound, Lala. <laughs> yeah, pretty good to annoy someone. What? Nothing, nothing. You do a good dinosaur sound. Ah, oh, thank you. Roar! Oh, that sounds like another dinosaur. I am the Pulsaratops. Ceratops, I am the Lalasaurus. La 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 la. Oh yeah. Ow. Yeah. And I am the rare Dipsaurus. <laughs> and I am the Tinko Winkosaur. Roar! <laughs> wow. Those are great dinosaur names. Yeah, I know. I just love dinosaurs. I love how big they are. Yeah, but you know, Dipsy, not all the dinosaurs were big back then. Some were really small, too. Yeah, and some could even fly. Oh, yeah, of course. I know that. Oh, yes, there are all sorts of different types of dinosaurs. Some were orange. Some were green. Yeah, green's my favorite color. And some of them had scales. Some of them were really big. And some are really small. And some dinosaurs like to sing and dance. <laughs> huh? 
And some dinosaurs like to wear cool sneakers. And some dinosaurs like to have tea parties. Well, no, 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 no. Barney, BJ, Baby Bop, that's what you dinosaurs like to do. The dinosaurs back then, they don't sing or dance. Yeah, and they do not wear sneakers. And they definitely do not have tea parties. Oh. Okay, then. All right, then. Come on, dinosaurs. Let's roar on out of here. <laughs> Stupendous. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Dinosaurs are so amazing. Yeah, they sure are. But, you know, I want to learn more about dinosaurs. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Well, how about we see a TV event about it? Oh, yes. Good idea. Yeah. Oh, it's time! Come on, Dino Tubbies, let's go! All right, all boy, run! All right, Windmill, who do you choose? Yes! It's me! All right! Let's see the TV event! Yeah! All about dinosaurs! Yeah! Let's hope it's good! Hey! Hello! What's up, dude? Hi! Today, we are all going to the museum to see some dinosaurs! Oh yeah! It's gonna be so cool! But they're not real dinosaurs! They're skeletons! Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, come and like see with us. Yeah, come on everyone, let's go. All right, this is it you guys. All right, like so exciting. Oh yeah. Wow. Look at all the cool dinosaur skeletons. Oh, yeah! Lots of them! Wow! What a neck! I wonder how many ties it can wear! I don't know, Squarey! Who knows? Yeah! Wow, look at this dinosaur. It like has scales on its back. Oh yeah, I think I've seen that dinosaur before. I think it's called a Stegosaurus. Well, it's pretty cool. Oh yeah, it is. Each dinosaur is so unique in its own special way. Whoa! Now those are some big boys right there! Oh yeah!
Oh boy, there's the main king of all the dinosaurs, the T-Rex. Oh yeah, the Tyrannosaurus Rex, that's a good one. Oh yeah, it sure is. Wow, dinosaurs are so amazing. Oh yeah, they sure are, Squarey. But we've seen all the dinosaurs now, so it's time for us to go. Oh, okay. This was like so interesting. Yeah, you said it. It was awesome. I love dinosaurs. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye. See you later, dude. Bye, everybody. Signing off. See you later. Ha ha. Bye-bye! Wow! What a cool dinosaur museum! Yeah! And I can't believe that it has real dinosaurs there! Well, skeletons. Yeah, that was a great TV event about dinosaurs! Yeah, and we learned a lot from it! A great dinosaur roar. Why, thank you, Dipsy. Pinky winky, pinky winky, pinky winky, pinky winky. Uh oh, guys. Oh, oh, Tinky winky. Or should I say, Tinker Winkle Saw? <laughs> oh, I'm not a Tinker Winkle Saw anymore. I am now a paleontologist. Ah, uh, pardon? Paleontologist? Is that some sort of dinosaur? No, it's not a type of dinosaur. It's a person who studies all about the prehistoric age. Wow! Oh, that's cool! Do they study about dinosaurs? Yeah, especially dinosaurs. That's so cool! Wow! Yeah, and I want to study some different types of dinosaurs. <laughs> Did I hear somebody say they want to study some different types of dinosaurs? Huh? <gasps> oh, yes! Well, you're in luck, because the three of us are dinosaurs! Oh, yeah! New dinosaurs to discover! Oh, boy! I'm going to study you guys! Oh, goody! We're going to be studied! Oh, oh stupendous! Oh, oh, oh. oh, this ought to be good! Uh-huh! Let's start off with you. Oh, goody. So, tell me about yourself. Well, my name is Baby Bop, and I am a green dinosaur who loves tea parties and wears pink slippers and a pink bow. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. Very interesting. Now I want to ask you, what kind of dinosaur are you? Uh, I am a Baby Boposaurus. Oh, sissy, that's not a real type of dinosaur. I know what she is. She is a Triceratops. Oh, yeah, I am a, a Tricera... Tri... What are those? Oh, so Baby Bop is a Triceratops. Now that is fascinating. Oh, hey, do me next. Me next. Oh, okay. So, BJ, tell me about yourself. Well, my name is BJ. And I'm yellow, and I like to wear cool sneakers and a hat. Oh, yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. Very interesting. Now, what kind of dinosaur are you? Well, I am a protoceratops. A protoceratops. Wow. BJ is a protoceratops. Fascinating. Very fascinating indeed. Yeah, you betcha, Tinky Winky. All right. Save the best for last. All right, Barney, tell me about yourself. 
Well, my name is Barney, and I am a magical purple dinosaur. <laughs> wow! A magical purple dinosaur. Now that is extraordinary. Tell me more. Well, I'm purple, I have yellow toes, and a green belly, and my tail, and I like to sing and dance. <laughs> a singing, dancing dinosaur. Very interesting. Now, what kind of dinosaur are you, Barney? Why, I, Barney the Dinosaur, I am a Tyrannosaurus Rex. T-Rex for short. Wow! Barney is a T-Rex. How interesting. Wow! Baby Bob the Triceratops, BJ the Protosaurus, and Barney the T-Rex. Three different types of dinosaurs. I know! Awesome! As a paleontologist, I have discovered the types of dinosaurs of Barney, BJ, and Baby Bob. But there's still one thing I do know about them. Really? What's that? That you three are the most beloved dinosaurs in the world. Oh yeah, we are! Oh, go on! <laughs> yeah! You guys sure are! Yeah! I love dinosaurs! Me too! Me three! Very much! Yeah! Big hug? Big dino hug! Oh yeah, now we're talking! Oh, oh super D duper! Bring it in, everyone! Big hug! Oh yeah! Ha ha ha! A goodie! Oh yeah! Oh, oh, oh super dino D duper! Oh, oh, oh. Oh, 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 yes, Super D Duper.
Oh, oh, that was super D duper. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, me too. Yeah, that was a great magic event. It sure was. Oh, yes. Uh huh. The magic windmill is about to stop spinning for Tubby Bye Bye. Yeah, we gotta go now. Oh, already? All right then, Tilly Tubbies. Yeah, it was nice hanging out with you. Yeah, goodbye. Bye bye, dinosaurs. Bye, dinosaurs. Bye bye, Barty, BJ, Baby Bob. Bye bye. Ooh, <laughs> bye bye, Tilly Tubbies, and goodbye to you too. And remember, I love you. <laughs> Time for Tubby Bye Bye. Time for Tubby Bye Bye. Time for Tubby Bye Bye. Well, looks like it's time for us to say goodbye. But before we say goodbye, let's talk about our favorite parts. Yeah. My favorite part was pretending to be a paleontologist and discovering different types of dinosaurs. My favorite part was when we all pretended to be dinosaurs. My favorite part was seeing the Dinosaur Museum in the TV event! Hey, hey! Hello! What's up, dude? Hi! Today, we are all going to the museum to see some dinosaurs! Oh yeah, it's gonna be so cool! But, they're not real dinosaurs, they're skeletons! Yeah, it's pretty cool! Yeah, come and like, see with us! Yeah, come on everyone, let's go! All right, this is it, you guys. All right, like so exciting. Oh, yeah. Wow. Look at all the cool dinosaur skeletons. Oh, yeah, lots of them. Wow! What a neck! I wonder how many ties it can wear. I don't know, Squarey. Who knows? Yeah. Wow, look at this dinosaur. It like has scales on its back. Oh yeah, I think I've seen that dinosaur before. I think it's called a Stegosaurus. Well, it's pretty cool. Oh yeah, it is. Each dinosaur is so unique in its own special way. Whoa! Now those are some big boys right there! Oh yeah!
Oh boy, there's the main king of all the dinosaurs, the T-Rex. Oh yeah, the Tyrannosaurus Rex, that's a good one. Oh yeah, sure is. Wow, dinosaurs are so amazing. Oh yeah, they sure are, Squarey. But we've seen all the dinosaurs now, so it's time for us to go. Oh, okay. This was like so interesting. Yeah, you said it. It was awesome. I love dinosaurs. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye. See you later, dude. Bye, everybody. Signing off. See you later. Ha <laughs> ha. But before we say goodbye, let's talk about our favorite parts. Yeah. My favorite part was pretending to be a paleontologist and discovering different types of dinosaurs. My favorite part was when we all pretended to be dinosaurs. My favorite part was seeing the dinosaur museum in the TV event. And my favorite part was when we all had a big dino hug. a great dinosaur roar. Why, thank you, Dipsy. Tinky winky, tinky winky, pinky winky, tinky winky. Uh oh, guys. Oh, hello, Tinky winky. Or should I say, Tinka Winkle Saw? <laughs> oh, I'm not a Tinka Winkle Saw anymore. I am now a paleontologist. Uh, pardon? Paltalist? Is that some sort of dinosaur? No, it's not a type of dinosaur. It's a person who studies all about the prehistoric age. Wow! Oh, that's cool! Do they study about dinosaurs? Yeah, especially dinosaurs. That's so cool! Wow! Yeah, and I want to study some different types of dinosaurs. Whoa! <laughs> Did I hear somebody say they want to study some different types of dinosaurs? Huh? Oh, yes! Well, you're in luck, because the three of us are dinosaurs! Oh, yeah! New dinosaurs to discover! Oh, boy! I'm going to study you guys! Oh, goody! We're going to be studied! Oh, oh stupendous! Oh, oh, oh. oh, this ought to be good! Uh-huh! Let's start off with you! Oh goody! So, tell me about yourself! Well, my name is Baby Bop, and I am a green dinosaur who loves tea parties, who wears pink slippers and a pink bow. Yeah! Aha! Uh -huh. Very interesting! Now I want to ask you, what kind of dinosaur are you? Uh, I am a Baby Bopasaurus? Oh, sissy, that's not a real type of dinosaur. I know what she is. She is a Triceratops. Oh, yeah, I am a, a Tricera... Tri... What are those? Oh, so Baby Bob is a Triceratops. Now that is fascinating. Oh, hey, do me next. Me next. Oh, okay. So, BJ, tell me about yourself. Well, my name is BJ... And I'm yellow, and I like to wear cool sneakers and a hat. Oh, yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. Very interesting. Now, what kind of dinosaur are you? Well, I am a protoceratops. A protoceratops. Wow. BJ is a protoceratops. Fascinating. Very fascinating indeed. Yeah, you betcha, Tinky Winky. All right. Save the best for last. All right, Barney, tell me about yourself. Well, my name is Barney, and I am a magical purple dinosaur. <laughs> wow, a magical purple dinosaur. Now that is extraordinary. Tell me more. 
well, I'm purple, I have yellow toes, and the green belly, and my tail, and I like to sing and dance. Oh, a singing, dancing dinosaur. Very interesting. Now, what kind of dinosaur are you, Barney? Why, I, Barney the Dinosaur, I am a Tyrannosaurus Rex. T-Rex for short. Wow! Barney is a T-Rex. How interesting! Wow! Baby Bob the Triceratops, BJ the Protosaurus, and Barney the T-Rex. Three different types of dinosaurs. I know! Awesome! As a paleontologist, I have discovered the types of dinosaurs of Barney, BJ, and Baby Bob. But there's still one thing I do know about them. Really? What's that? That you three are the most beloved dinosaurs in the world. Oh yeah, we are! Oh, oh go on! <laughs> yeah! You guys sure are! Yeah! I love dinosaurs! Me too! Me three! Very much! Yeah! Big hug? Big dino hug! Oh yeah, now we're talking! Oh, oh super D duper! Bring it in, everyone! Big hug! Oh yeah! Ha ha ha! A goodie! Oh yeah! Oh, oh, oh super dino D duper! Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, I like that! Yeah, me too! Yeah, that was a great magical event! It sure was! Oh, yes! Uh-huh! Uh-oh! The magic windmill is about to stop spinning for Tubby Bye-Bye! Yeah, we gotta go now! Oh, already? All right then, Teletubbies. Yeah, it was nice hanging out with you. Yeah, goodbye. Bye-bye, dinosaurs. Bye, dinosaurs. Bye-bye, Barney, BJ, Baby Bob. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye, Teletubbies. And goodbye to you, too. And remember, I love you. <laughs> Time for Tubby Bye Bye! Time for Tubby Bye Bye! Time for Tubby Bye Bye! Well, looks like it's time for us to say goodbye! But before we say goodbye, let's talk about our favorite parts! Yeah! My favorite part was pretending to be a paleontologist and discovering different types of dinosaurs! My favorite part was when we all pretended to be dinosaurs! My favorite part was seeing the Dinosaur Museum in the TV event! And my favorite part was when we all had a big dino hug with Barney, BJ, and Baby Bob. It was great! Today was so much fun! But the time has flown by! The sun is setting in the sky! And now it's time to say goodbye! Bye bye. 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 Papa. Eating sugar? No, Papa.
papa. Telling lies? No, papa. Open your mouth. Ha ha ha. Thank you. 
Papa. Eating sugar? No, Papa. Telling lies? No, Papa. Open your mouth. Ha, ha, ha. Johnny, Johnny. Yes, Papa. Eating sugar? No, Papa. Telling lies? No, Papa. Open your mouth. Ha, ha, ha. Johnny, Johnny. Yes, Papa. Eating sugar? No, Papa. Telling lies? No, Papa. Open your mouth. Ha, ha, ha. Johnny, Johnny. Yes, Papa. Eating sugar? No, Papa. Telling lies? No, Papa. Open your mouth. Ha, ha, ha. Johnny, Johnny. Yes, Papa. Eating sugar? No, Papa. Telling lies? No, Papa. Open your mouth. Ha, ha, ha. Johnny, Johnny. Yes, Papa. Eating sugar? No, Papa. Telling lies? No, Papa. Open your mouth. Ha, ha, ha. Johnny, Johnny. Yes, Papa. Eating sugar? No, Papa. Telling lies? No, Papa. Open your mouth. Ha, ha, ha. Johnny, Johnny. Yes, Papa. Eating sugar? No, Papa. Telling lies? No, Papa. Open your mouth. Ha, ha, ha. Johnny, Johnny. Yes, Papa. Eating sugar? No, Papa. Telling lies? No, Papa. Open your mouth. Ha, ha, ha. Johnny, Johnny. Yes, Papa. Eating sugar? No, Papa. Telling lies? No, Papa. Open your mouth. Ha, ha, ha. Johnny, Johnny. Yes, Papa. Eating sugar? No, Papa. Telling lies? No, Papa. Open your mouth. Ha, ha, ha. Johnny, Johnny. Yes, Papa. Eating sugar? No, Papa. Telling lies? No, Papa. Open your mouth. Ha, ha, ha. Johnny, Johnny. Yes, Papa. Eating sugar? No, Papa. Telling lies? No, Papa. Open your mouth. Ha, ha, ha. Johnny, Johnny. Yes, Papa. Eating sugar? 
No, Papa. Telling lies? No, Papa. Open your mouth. Ha, ha, ha. Johnny, Johnny. Yes, Papa. Eating sugar? No, Papa. Telling lies? No, Papa. Open your mouth. Ha, ha, ha. Johnny, Johnny. Yes, Papa. Eating sugar? No, Papa. Telling lies? No, Papa. Open your mouth. Ha, ha, ha. Johnny, Johnny. Yes, Papa. Eating sugar? No, Papa. Telling lies? No, Papa. Open your mouth. Ha, ha, ha. Johnny, Johnny. Yes, Papa. Eating sugar? No, Papa. Telling lies? No, Papa. Open your mouth. Ha, ha, ha. Johnny, Johnny. Yes, Papa. Eating sugar? No, Papa. Telling lies? No, Papa. Open your mouth. Ha, ha, ha. Johnny, Johnny. Yes, Papa. Eating sugar? No, Papa. Telling lies? No, Papa. Open your mouth. Ha, ha, ha. Johnny, Johnny. Yes, Papa. Eating sugar? No, Papa. Telling lies? No, Papa. Open your mouth. Ha, ha, ha. Johnny, Johnny. Yes, Papa. Eating sugar? No, Papa. Telling lies? No, Papa. Open your mouth. Ha, ha, ha. Johnny, Johnny. Yes, Papa. Eating sugar? No, Papa. Telling lies? No, Papa. Open your mouth. Ha, ha, ha.
Open your mouth! Ha Johnny Johnny Yes papa Eating sugar No papa Telling lies No papa Open your mouth Ha 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 Johnny Johnny Yes papa Eating sugar No papa Telling lies No papa Open your mouth Ha 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 Johnny Johnny Yes papa Eating sugar No papa Telling lies No papa Open your mouth Ha ha ha
on CBeebies. Sweet potato only on CBeebies. CBB's Bedtime Story. Hello, I'm Justin. Wow, look at all of these parcels. Hey, did you send them to me? Uh, no. Well, I wonder who sent them. Wait a second. This parcel has a label on it. Shall I read it? OK. It says, Dear Justin. <laughs> well, that's me. And then it says, Open me. Shall I open the parcel? <laughs> OK, how exciting. Ribbit. Ribbit. Whoa! wonder what that is. Ribbit. <gasps> oh, wow, look, everyone. Ribbit. Boing. It's a frog. Ribbit. Ribbit. <laughs> a jumpy frog. Boing. <laughs> Aha! I think I know where these parcels came from. They came from the zoo! Tonight's story is called Dear Zoo. And it's written and illustrated by Rod Campbell. 
I wrote to the zoo to send me a pet. They sent me an... <gasps> elephant! Oh, wow! He was too big! I sent him back. So, they sent me a a giraffe. <laughs> he was too tall. I sent him back. So, they sent me a a lion. <laughs> he was too fierce. I sent him back. <laughs> so, they sent me a Camel! <laughs> he was too grumpy. I sent him back. Hmm. So, they sent me a snake. He was too scary. I sent him back. So, they sent me a... Monkey! <laughs> he was too naughty. I sent him back. So, they sent me a... Ribbit. Ribbit. A frog. He was too jumpy. Ribbit. Ribbit. I sent him back. Boing. <whistles> so... They thought very hard and sent me a ruff, 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 ruff. <gasps> puppy. Ruff, 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 ruff. <laughs> oh, he was perfect. I kept him. <laughs> ruff, ruff. Oh. What a wonderful story. And look, a puppy. <laughs> a sleepy puppy. Are you sleepy after all that animal fun? <sighs> wow, I'm sleepy too. Join me again soon for another Bedtime story. Night, night. Ruff, ruff, ruff. <laughs> the time has come to say good night, to say sleep tight till the morning light. The time has
time has come to say good night, to say sleep tight till the morning light. The time has come to say good night. It's the end of a lovely day. The time has come. Blondie went, Blondie went 
to school one day, school one day, school one day. It followed her to school one day, which was against the rules. It made the children laugh and play, laugh and play, laugh and play. It made the children laugh and play to see the lamb at school. Still it lingered near. Why does the lamb blow blondie so low, blondie so low, blondie so? Why does the lamb blow blondie so? The eager children cry. Why blondie loves the lamb? You know the lamb. You know the lamb. You know why blondie loves the lamb? You know the teacher did. Straight to 
Miss Polly had a dolly who was sick, sick, sick. She called for the doctor to be quick, quick, quick. The doctor came with his bag and his hat, and he knocked on the door with a rat a tat tat. Looked at the dolly and he shook his head. He said, Miss Polly, put her straight to bed. He wrote on a paper for a bill, bill, bill. I'll be back in the morning with the bill, bill, bill. Miss Polly had a dolly who was sick, sick, sick. She called for the doctor to be quick, quick, quick. The doctor came with his bag and his hat, and he knocked on the door with a rat a tat tat. He looked at the dolly and he shook his head. He said, Miss Polly, put her straight. Miss Polly had a dolly who was sick, sick, sick. She called for the doctor to be quick, quick, quick. The doctor came with his bag and his hat, and he knocked on the door with a rat a tat tat. Looked at the dolly and he shook his head. He said, Miss Polly, put her straight to bed. He wrote. Miss Polly had a dolly who was sick, sick, sick. She called for the doctor to be quick, quick, quick. The doctor came with his bag and his hat, and he knocked on the door with a rat a tat tat. He looked at the dolly and he shook his head. He said, Miss Polly, put her straight. Miss Polly had a dolly who was sick, sick, sick. She called for the doctor to. Its largest hospital trusts. A BBC Newsnight investigation broadcast. For the past six months, Newsnight has been investigating one of England's worst performing health trusts. At University Hospitals, Birmingham. We were repeatedly told it had a toxic culture. I think of the trust in the past four or five years. The way it has been run really is a bit like the mafia. We heard from a governor of the trust who resigned after he says his warnings were ignored. It seems that we've had a bullying culture going on for years and years and years at the trust that hasn't been dealt with. We heard allegations that patient safety warnings are ignored. It was really clear that people were being discouraged from reporting um, incidents because the trust management wanted to say they ran an exemplary hospital and from doctors who feared that if they spoke up, they'd be punished. Please be careful what you do, what you say, who you criticise. So if you criticise senior management, they'll have you. Despite strenuous denials from UHB, NHS England took action. Not one, but three reviews have now been announced by the NHS in the region. The Under Fire Trust, which serves two million patients across four Birmingham hospitals, was recently ranked 119 out of 120 in England, and politicians are now calling for a mid-staff-style independent inquiry. Looking for the Wall Street Journal in Moscow on charges of espionage. A Russian foreign ministry spokesperson said they believe Evan Gershkovich was conducting activities not related to journalism on assignment from the Americans. In a statement, the Wall Street Journal said it vehemently denies the allegations from the FSB, that's Russia's security service, and goes on to say we seek the immediate release of our trusted and dedicated reporter Evan Gershkovich. We stand in solidarity with Evan and his family. Well, the BBC Russian journalist Sergei Gorashko has more. He started uh, as a Moscow Times re reporter for the journal in Moscow. Then he moved to the Agence France Presse. And uh, afterwards, he joined the Wall Street Journal team. He's a, well, a de dedicated and talented reporter who is a son of uh, emigres from Russian. He came to Russia like in 2000s. Uh, 
and uh, he's, he speaks Russian very well. He's uh, one of the uh, small number of foreign journalists who decided to stay in the country even after the Russia started the invasion of Ukraine, and he kept up his reporting from Moscow uh, amid all those uh, uh, risks, like uh, being accused of espionage as well, because uh, there were already cases when journalists in Russia were accused of uh, spying and of transmitting secrets uh, to foreigners, uh, like the Ivan Safronov's case, a military observer who has been sentenced to 22 years in prison in September 2022. And presumably, Gershkovich will be taken to prison uh, for at least like two months uh, for the time while the investigation on him will be open. This is a clear signal for foreign journalists who are still working in Russia that if they would like to keep their work and if they uh, would like not being arrested, uh, the only things they, that they can do is that to transmit official lines from the Russian government and nothing else. Because uh, any sort of gathering information in Russia, any sort of reporting something which contradicts the official line can be considered by the regime as espionage, as hostile uh, actions, and uh, can be considered as uh, uh, spying, and uh, a person can be taken to court and uh, arrested. Uh, Gershkovich is, uh, looks like a hostage for Russian regime, and uh, he, he probably could be uh, uh, exchanged for some Russian agents who were arrested abroad in the late latest months. As for instance, uh, a basketball player Brittany Griner has been uh, changed on uh, Russian arms dealer Victor Boot. Uh, so uh, the job of a journalist in Russia is becoming more and more risky apparently and uh, this is a very, uh, very disturbing situation of course for the freedom of speech and freedom of press in Russia. Here on Verified Live, we have a BBC investigation which suggests at least 25,000 Russian soldiers have been killed in Ukraine, four times higher than the figure acknowledged by Moscow. The research also suggests many of the casualties are now older fighters with little or no training. Significant numbers have also been recruited from prisons. Here's our correspondent Olga Ivshina with this special report. These are the war graves Russia doesn't want to talk about. Since December, the BBC has located seven new cemeteries dotted across Russia and occupied Ukraine. They are filled with the graves of poorly trained fighters. Many were prisoners recruited by the notorious Wagner mercenary group. And the cemeteries are growing rapidly. This one is about 20 times bigger than it was six months ago. Since the start of the war, we have been verifying photos of graves and social media posts with the independent Russian website Media Zona and volunteers inside the country. So far, we have identified 25,000 names. This is four times more than Russia has acknowledged. It's illegal to report anything but the official death toll inside Russia. So we have come to Kyrgyzstan to speak to the families of fighters who have died. Hundreds of people from countries like this that were once part of the Soviet Union have signed up to join Putin's forces. Filming TikToks on the way to war, 21-year-old paratrooper Sergak Bek is typical of those who died at the start of the conflict, a young, highly trained professional soldier in the Russian army. He always wanted to be the first. I think that's why he decided to join the military. And there he was also given the choice, apparently. He chose to be there. Go to war, you mean? Yes, yes. As a professional soldier, he was buried with full military honours after he was killed in action in May 2022. But six months later, in a nearby village, there was no military funeral for another fighter, Ayan even though he also died on the front line. That's because he wasn't a professional soldier, but a prisoner serving a seven-year sentence for assault. He had signed up to fight for the mercenary group Wagner, hoping to win his freedom in return for a six-month contract. A man called and told me that my son died fighting in Ukraine. I was shocked. I asked, how come my son is even at the war? Did my son die for nothing? Am I going to cry until the end of my life? The deaths of Sirgakbek and Ayan show how Russia's war has changed. 
In the first three months of the conflict, it lost large numbers of professional soldiers. But in the past three months, it's non-professional fighters who have recently joined the Russian forces that are dying in greater numbers. The shift in demographics and Russian losses reflects not only the fact that the Russians lost a large number of their professional troops early in the war, but also the fact that they've shifted their tactics. They now see their professional soldiers as a resource that is to be held in reserve and only used when the conditions are right. Now they are letting the brunt of that reconnaissance offensive activity being led by mobilized troops that they treat in quite a disposable way. Only publicly reported deaths are captured by our account. Estimates from Britain's Ministry of Defense suggest the true figure is likely to be at least twice as high. The BBC contacted the Russian government for comment, but it has not responded. And every day, the messages and photos of graves keep coming. That was Olga Ivchenko with that uh, special report. Well, uh, let's turn to President Putin because he has warned there is a very serious risk of NATO becoming involved in the war in Ukraine. He was speaking at an economic forum in St. Petersburg amid reports Western countries are set to announce plans to train Ukrainian pilots to fly U.S. fighter jets. Well, Mr. Putin said that Russian military would have to consider how to respond if planes located at air bases outside of Ukraine were used to attack Russian forces. <laughs> Leopard tanks are burning. F-16s will burn in the same way. I have no doubts. But if they're used outside of Ukraine's borders to be used in combat, we will have to look at how and where we are going to target the weapons that are going to be used against us in the battlefield. There is a very serious threat that NATO is going to be involved in this military conflict. Any viewers joining us, just to let any viewers joining us know, uh, the main headline, of course, is that the report has been released and it finds that Boris Johnson deliberately misled Commons. The Privileges Committee has concluded that Boris Johnson deliberately misled the House of Commons, committing a serious contempt. And uh, their recommendation was that Boris Johnson should be suspended from the House for 90 days. And uh, they add that they recommend he should not be entitled to a former member's pass. Now, as Jonathan mentioned, uh, these are pretty heavy sanctions. Uh, but Jonathan, if, I, if I've still got you, what some of the detail that we were looking forward to seeing in in this report of course uh, based on boris johnson's defense is how do you prove intent because one of the key words here was deliberately misled parliament and uh, part of boris johnson's defense was that none of this was deliberate Yes, the overall aim of the committee was to establish whether Boris Johnson misled the House of Commons, but he himself accepts in hindsight that the statements he said in the House of Commons at the dispatch box were misleading. But he says that he was saying what he believed to be true at the time and only uh, since events have been documented and details have come to light uh, can they be said to be deliberately uh, or inadvertently misleading. And the, and the committee's definition here, which is important to remember at this point as we go through the report, was whether Boris Johnson misled the House of Commons inadvertently, recklessly or intentionally. So did he do it by mistake, effectively? Did he do it because he wasn't really across the detail and hadn't appraised himself of the, of the facts as he should have done? Or was it uh, deliberate? Uh, was it a deliberate attempt to mislead MPs. And we'll go through the detail of the report to see what it has to say uh, on that. But I just wanted to draw your attention at this early stage to here where the committee sets out its possible punishments that it can recommend to Boris Johnson as available to it. Uh, either no further action, running through several options, go, rising in severity, requiring an apology in writing, uh, right up to recommending expulsion from the House. And if we can go through now here to point 210, and this relates to Boris Johnson's statements in the House of Commons, I think I'm right in saying, and the assessment that the committee has come to there. They say we have concluded above that in deliberately misleading the House, Mr Johnson committed a serious contempt. Now, you'll hear that word a lot today, contempt of Parliament. It effectively means getting in the way or obstructing 
the workings of Parliament, the proper democratic process. And it's a very severe offence, about as severe as it can get in parliamentary terms. The contempt was all the more serious, the committee says, because it was committed by the Prime Minister, the most senior member of the government. There is no precedent for a Prime Minister, they say, having been found to have deliberately misled the House. He misled the House on an issue of the greatest importance, the committee says, to the House and to the public, and did so repeatedly. He declined our invitation to reconsider his assertions that what we had said to the House was truthful. His defence to the allegation that he misled was an ex post facto justification and no more than an artifice. He misled the committee in the presentation of his evidence. So some very strong, very critical, very damning language there at the crucial part of this report where they explain their justification for asserting that Boris Johnson deliberately misled the House. We are waiting to hear what Boris Johnson's response will be. He has promised that it will be uh, a hearty one. But looking back uh, to when he stepped down as uh, a Tory MP, of course, he had been given advance sight of, of, of this report. So uh, just talk us through what we've heard uh, from Boris Johnson already. Sure. If you give me a second, I'll be able to give you Boris Johnson's response uh, to this report today, which we actually uh, have had this morning. Uh, but just you're right to highlight what he said already, because he's tried to get his version of events in early. He was sent a draft copy of the findings of the report, and he said that he was bewildered uh, at what he saw as the findings of a kangaroo court and a political hit job. Uh, we have a response from Boris Johnson to the final publication of the report this morning uh, and I'll read you it now. It's uh, a fairly lengthy response uh, but it is now many months, Mr Johnson says, since people started to warn me about the intentions of the Privileges Committee. He goes on to say they told me that it was a kangaroo court and that they uh, that it was being driven relentlessly by the political agenda of Harriet Harman. That's the Labour chair, veteran Labour MP chairing the Privileges Committee. Uh, and he goes on to say, supplied with skewed legal advice with the sole political objective of finding me guilty and expelling me from Parliament. So essentially challenging the legitimacy of this committee in his response. They also warned me that most members had already expressed prejudicial views, especially Harriet Harman, in a way that would not be tolerated in a normal legal process. Just, just excuse me for reading this off the screen here. It's a very lengthy response, so I'm not going to give you all of it, but you get a flavour of Boris Johnson's response there to the damning findings uh, of this report. Uh, but I, I think in hearing Mr Johnson's response this morning, which is typically bullish uh, and in line with everything he has said up until this point, trying to challenge the authority and legitimacy of this committee, we don't lose sight of the critical language that the MPs have used here and, uh, and a finding that I don't think we've seen the like of in, in the history uh, of these, uh, the Privileges Committee certainly, but any parliamentary investigation into a member of the House of Commons conduct, certainly for a former Prime Minister, as the committee highlights here, to have been found to have de deliberately misled the House on an issue, they say, of the greatest importance to the House and to the public, and did so repeatedly. Now, the United Nations has called for urgent action to prevent more migrants drowning at sea. It comes after an overloaded boat sank off the coast of Greece on Wednesday. 78 people are known to have died, but hundreds more are still missing. What happened on Wednesday underscores the need to investigate people smugglers and human traffickers and ensure they are brought to justice. The High Commissioner reiterated his call to states to open up more regular migration channels, enhance responsibility sharing, ensure arrangements for the safe and timely disembarkation of all people rescued at sea. Well, the Greek authorities are under mounting pressure to explain their role in this tragedy because new claims have emerged suggesting the boat capsized after Coast Guards attached a rope to it. The Greek Coast Guard service previously had said it kept a discreet distance from the vessel. 
Our correspondent Sofia Petitza has this report from southern Greece. Two brothers reunited. Mohammed found his 18-year-old brother, Fedi, from Syria at the port of Kalamata. He's one of 104 people who have been rescued from one of Greece's worst ever migrant shipwrecks. Now he's 18, 18 years, 18 years. I lived in Libya almost two years. They set off from Libya and were trying to reach Italy. It's still unclear how many people were on board. We understand that they travelled under very difficult uh, conditions uh, for many days uh, in, a, in, a situation, in, a, in conditions of overcrowding. There were many on the boat, some 750, most of them men, but they were, we heard that there were also some women and children. 79 people have died after the boat capsized, but there are fears that the number could be much higher. Could this tragedy have been avoided? The Greek Coast Guard says the migrants did not want their help, a claim that's been challenged. So we've been trying to piece together what exactly happened. At around 8 a.m. on Tuesday, the Greek authorities are first informed about the fishing vessel. The Coast Guard has first contact at 11 a.m. and claims it doesn't request assistance. A little later, an emergency helpline for migrants in trouble at sea receives multiple distress calls. The migrant boat has no publicly available tracking data, but BBC Verify has used a ship monitoring website to follow the movements of boats in the area that offered assistance. At 3pm, Greece sends a nearby commercial vessel, Lucky Sailor, to the migrant boat, supplying it with food and water. Tuesday evening, a Coast Guard vessel sails near the fishing boat and from a distance apparently concludes there was no problem with its navigation. But less than four hours later, the migrant boat overturns and sinks. The way the Greek authorities have been handling this is being criticised by many people here. Last night, there were protests in the cities of Athens and Thessaloniki. Critics say the Coast Guard should have tried a rescue if the boat was unsafe, whether or not passengers requested it. Nine people were arrested. They face charges of people trafficking. On Monday, they will be questioned by the prosecutor leading the investigation into what happened. But for now, there are still many unanswered questions about how this tragedy unfolded. Sofia Bethidza, BBC News in southern Greece. See, far, far away, and scientists believe they've picked up shockwaves from supermassive black holes which exist at the, uh, the centre of every galaxy. They say they could hold information about some of the best-kept secrets of the universe. Halap Ghosh explains. Up in space, at the heart of every galaxy, is thought to be a gigantic black hole. Here's a real picture of the one at the centre of our own Milky Way. It's four million times the mass of our Sun. It became that big by colliding with other huge black holes inside other galaxies. Astronomers at Jodrell Bank and across the world think they've detected some of these cataclysmic events. Pulsars, which are like nature's clocks, really. These On are the dish of the giant Lovell telescope, Dr Hannah Middleton tells me that ideas on how galaxies merge and grow have all been theoretical, until maybe now. We believe that galaxies and the black holes at the centre of them grow over time by mergers, but we haven't got evidence for this as yet. So if this is uh, the signature of these mergers, it teaches us about the formation of galaxies throughout the universe. Astronomers have made the detections by measuring the signals coming from spinning objects in space called pulsars, which are flashing stars at the end of their lives. Pulsars are the lighthouses of the universe, sending out bursts of radio waves at regular intervals. The researchers noticed that something was changing their speed ever so slightly. They think that it's caused by gravitational waves constantly bombarding the Earth and the source, they believe, is giant black holes in orbit around each other all across space. These are at the heart of distant galaxies orbiting each other, 
The forces between them are so powerful that they distort time and space and send ripples of gravitational waves across the universe. The Lovell Telescope is among a network of observatories that have picked up these gravitational waves. Astronomers want to use them to study the black holes. Currently the signal that we're seeing is a, is a noisy background from all over space. It's a bit like being in a, in a noisy restaurant with people talking all around you. What we hope is that in the near future we'll be able to zoom in and listen to some individual conversations, take the measurements from individual black holes and we'll be able to really zoom in and study them. The researchers now have a new study of the cosmos. They hope to learn how galaxies formed and discover new things that may reveal how the universe first came into existence. Palab Ghosh, BBC News, at the Lovell Telescope at Jodrell Bank. Coronaviruses are a type of virus. The one we're all talking about is new and it causes a disease called COVID-19. Now, most people will only be mildly affected by it, but it can kill. It starts by infecting our upper respiratory tracts, which are the airways from your nose to just above your vocal cords. You may develop a fever as your immune system starts to fight the virus and a dry cough. That's one where you don't produce any phlegm. The virus can then spread to the lungs, making it harder for people to breathe and it can cause pneumonia. In the most serious cases, people can die from the coronavirus. This is because the immune system can go into overdrive and that can lead to organ failure. So we need to do what we can to stop this virus from spreading. As it gets into your body by breathing it in or through your eyes and mouth, the best thing to do is wash your hands regularly and properly for at least 20 seconds. Catch your colds and sneezes in a tissue and avoid touching your face. Now to a galaxy far, far away, and scientists believe they've picked up shock waves from supermassive black holes which exist at the, at the center of every galaxy. They say they could hold information about some of the best kept secrets of the universe. Palap Ghosh explains. Up in space, at the heart of every galaxy, is thought to be a gigantic black hole. Here's a real picture of the one at the center of our own Milky Way. It's four million times the mass of our sun. It became that big by colliding with other huge black holes inside other galaxies. Astronomers at Jodrell Bank and across the world think they've detected some of these cataclysmic events. Pulsars, which are like nature's clocks, really. These are On the dish of the giant Lovell telescope, Dr Hannah Middleton tells me that ideas on how galaxies merge and grow have all been theoretical, until maybe now. We believe that galaxies and the black holes at the centre of them grow over time by mergers, but we haven't got evidence for this as yet. So if this is uh, the signature of these mergers, it teaches us about the formation of galaxies throughout the universe. Astronomers have made the detections by measuring the signals coming from spinning objects in space called pulsars, which are flashing stars at the end of their lives. Pulsars are the lighthouses of the universe, sending out bursts of radio waves at regular intervals. The researchers noticed that something was changing their speed ever so slightly. They think that it's caused by gravitational waves constantly bombarding the Earth. And the source, they believe, is giant black holes in orbit around each other all across space. These are at the heart of distant galaxies orbiting each other. The forces between them are so powerful that they distort time and space and send ripples of gravitational waves across the universe. The Lovell Telescope is among a network of observatories that have picked up these gravitational waves. Astronomers want to use them to study the black holes. Currently the signal that we're seeing is a, is a noisy background from all over space. It's a bit like being in a, in a noisy restaurant with people talking all around you. What we hope is that in the near future we'll be able to zoom in and listen to some individual conversations, take the measurements from individual black holes and we'll be able to really zoom in and study them. The researchers now have a new way to study the cosmos. They hope to learn how galaxies... 
And we start our programme in France, where officials say nearly a thousand protesters were arrested in a fourth night of rioting after the police shooting of 17-year-old Niall M in a Parisian suburb. Overnight, the interior minister claimed that there had been a downturn in the violence. Well, the unrest broke out in several cities, notably in Marseille, in the south of the country. Video footage showing streets on fire and shops, including a gun store, being attacked and looted by rioters. Well, despite the deployment of 45,000 police officers right across the country, the violence continued, including in the capital, Paris. And further afield, French media reported riots breaking out in French Caribbean territories, where at least one person was reportedly killed. The French football star and captain of the national team, Kylian Mbappe, has called for calm, saying violence solves nothing and that it should be replaced with mourning, dialogue and reconstruction. The police officer involved in the death of the teenager on Tuesday has been charged with voluntary homicide. Niall's funeral will be held later in his hometown of Nanterre, a suburb northwest of the capital. The family have requested journalists and the public to stay away. Regini Vajinathan begins our coverage. Across France, yet more rage. Streets under siege. A dramatic outpouring of anger after a 17-year-old, Nael, was killed by police during a traffic stop. Many of the rioters are teenagers, out despite a plea from France's president to parents to keep their children at home. As the protests have intensified, so too has the police presence. Across the country, from Friday into Saturday morning, more than 45,000 officers were deployed. And it's the police that is driving people onto the streets in the first place. Many here accuse officers of discrimination. And even the UN says that France needs to address its deep-rooted issues of racism in the police force. It's a concern crowds at this protest share. The country's foreign ministry says the UN's claims are unfounded. But the French police have long been plagued by accusations of racism. Many see this violence as a wake-up call. But for the government, containing it's a challenge. What began with the death of Nael has now come to represent something bigger. Regina Vardinathan, BBC News, Paris. Well, our Europe editor, Katia Adler, has an update for us from Nanterre, where the funeral for 17-year-old Niall is set to take place today. I'm in Nanterre, that is an area outside Paris where Nahel, the 17-year-old unarmed boy who was shot and killed by a French policeman earlier this week at a traffic stop, lived and died. As you say, his funeral will be taking place in a few hours' time. And again last night, it was the scene of destruction. You can see these burnt-out uh, cars behind me. Fireworks were set off at the police overnight. It was a loud night and a loud morning because the authorities here are trying to clear up uh, the mess ahead of the funeral. Nahel's family has appealed for calm and so has France's national football team. They say it's tragic what happened here and that working class suburbs like this where many people come from minority backgrounds are suffering and have grievances including, you know, they allege police brutality and daily discrimination but they say this is not to the way to deal with that. But these youth say they don't have a choice. This is the only way they're getting their voices heard. The French president hasn't imposed a state of emergency, but there are calls from the right and the far right uh, in France and from some police unions to do exactly that. Whereas the left and far left in France are saying he hasn't done enough to deal with the social problems in housing estates like this. So he's under fire politically mm. and on the streets of France. He talks about getting the situation under control, but there's no sign of that right now. Um, and catch you very quickly before we leave you. In terms of motivations, the, the conversation has moved on somewhat with um, allegations, I think, by Monsieur Macron himself saying that social media is playing a part now 
in inciting that violence. Is there any clear indication as to how this is being coordinated or who's uh, leading uh, some of these riots and these protests? And people are now saying, you know, it's, it's moved on from uh, the death of Niall and it's more gratuitous now. Well, no, it's it's not moved on, if you like. But if but if you talk to youths here, they'll say we face discrimination by police every day, but nobody listens to us when it's recorded. Mm. When someone holds up a phone and records it, it's irrefutable evidence. And what you have here about the killing of Niall was that originally the policeman who shot him said that he felt that his life and the life of his colleague was in danger by Niall. But when you had a look at that video, it clearly was not. And I think that helps trigger the outrage in areas like this, just like we saw uh, after the death of uh, George Floyd in the United States a couple of years ago, where the, a white policeman put his foot on the neck uh, of George Floyd for nine minutes um, after which he died. When you have this being passed around on social media, um, it, is, it is a reminder to people who feel discriminated against, who feel underprivileged in society, uh, that, that they are right to feel outraged and they want to do something about it. As I say again though, the rioters on the street are very young and a lot of people in this neighbourhood say they sympathise with the youngsters but violence is not their thing. So it would be wrong to say the entire neighbourhoods like this are out there saying go and burn things. That is not the case. But for the youths themselves, they say they want their voices heard. We that do though see instances of looting as well across the country and that clearly is a separate issue to those who say they're protesting in the name of Niall and others like him. Well, that was Katja Adler in Nanterre, another town that was uh, affected, city rather, that was affected uh, by the violence is in the north of France, in Lille. From there, here's Sophia Betitza. I'm in Roubaix, which is a suburb of Lille, one of the poorest parts of uh, France. Uh, the situation here is still tense. Overnight, about 70 people were arrested in this area. And uh, uh, there was a curfew imposed in some neighbourhoods here, a, co a curfew over um, uh, unaccompanied uh, minors. Uh, because, of course, so many of the people that have been rioting are very young, some as young as 30. Um, now, behind me, you can see uh, what remains of a building. This used to be an office building. About 500 people worked here, and it was a really important part of this community. Now, some protesters broke in in the middle of the night and set the whole building on fire. We can still see and smell the smoke. Um, across the street, there's a pharmacy, uh, which is also a health center, and it's one of very few places where people from this um, community could go and get treatment if they were ill, and that was looted and partially destroyed. So, you know, this morning, so many people here have told us what is the point of attacking pharmacies, offices, theatres. The feeling is that this is just not the right way to demand justice for now. And that was Sofia Batitza in the north of France.